Well, hello again. <laughs> so, uh, today we're in Luke 3, verses 1 through 14. Tonight, we'll be in the second half of that chapter. Um, this chapter is following immediately the passage we heard last week from Doug Faubel in Luke 2 with Jesus, um, 12 years old, growing up, losing his parents and going to the and then finding them again, or they finding him rather in the temple. Um, with so many different preachers filling the pulpit right now, it's hard to draw some continuity, but just know that we're trying to give you that whenever we can. <laughs> so um, in the near future, Kurt and I will both be preaching out of the lectionary passages, um, the Gospel of Luke. Um, and also a note about the preaching schedule it's all filled with familiar faces right now. So um, we'll have Marv Hoffman next week, Bill Vanderwerp coming back um, several times in February, um, and of course, Kurt and I. So with that, um, would you turn your Bibles to Luke 3, verse 1 through 14. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Itreria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the regions surrounding the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible, the message, um, it's called a baptism of life change leading to the repentance of sins, or the forgiveness of sins, rather. A baptism of life change. So I'm wondering, what do you do when someone tells you you're wrong? <laughs> when someone, a friend, a coworker or your mom tells you, hey, that wasn't right what you did. And what do you do when you know they're right? The easy answer, of course, is to admit that you're wrong, to apologize for whatever it was you did to the person you hurt, to go on with your life. But what if it's more complicated than that? What if fixing this mistake takes more than a simple, I'm sorry? What if it means turning your life around? 
turning from the path you're on to return to the straight and narrow? What do you do when all of a sudden that you've been getting it wrong for a while? That your friends have been getting it wrong for a while? I think that's what this moment was like for the crowds who came to, to hear John speak and to be baptized by him. The gospel crashed in on them as John told it, convicting them, causing them to question their assumptions of what is right and what is wrong and how important it is to do good, how important it is to love your neighbor. The Holy Spirit sent John to go ahead of Jesus, preparing the way for him by preaching this baptism of life change to anyone who would listen. And I called the sermon preparing the way of the Lord because that's what John is doing in his message to the crowds. He told them to make their paths straight because the crooked ways do not lead to God. He told them to repent because only the humble and contrite of heart can truly receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So working now through the passage, beginning in verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Luke begins by placing us in time, in a particular time. That long list of rulers, which maybe uh, we resent a little bit because we don't know how to say their names. That long list of rulers beginning with the Roman emperor um, would help contemporary readers to understand precisely when it was that John the Baptist began his ministry and thus when Jesus began his. Remember that Luke addressed his gospel and the book of Acts to someone named Theophilus. We don't know anything about Theophilus, who this person was, if it was a proper name or a title or if it was a group of people even. Um, Theophilus in Greek means lover of God. Maybe that's the important part. In any case, Luke writes in chapter 1 of his gospel that he is writing that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. Luke has gone out of his way to write a full and trustworthy account of the gospel um, of all that surrounded the life and ministry of Jesus. So he gives the reader facts, the specific year of its occurrence, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Everybody knew what that meant, who lived in that time. It would be like for us to say, yeah, it's happened in 2002 or 1975. We begin to call to mind what those days were like. He's also setting the stage for events that would happen later, um, including characters that would show up. Pontius Pilate is mentioned, Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests who would arrest Jesus and bring him to Pilate are mentioned here. But there's another layer to this. One of the claims that we make as Christians that's different from the rest of the world is that Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord. Like in the Apostles' Creed that we sang earlier, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He will come to judge the living and the dead. There was an emperor seated in Rome. There was a governor over Judea. And Galilee and everything else was split up into neat little chunks for humans to rule over. When the Spirit of God spoke to the wild son of a priest in the middle of the wilderness, telling him news that the emperor did not know, that the emperor did not allow, that a previous king, King Herod, had tried to squash by murdering infants 30 years before. And that news is that the Messiah had come. Not to operate inside our power structures, not to serve as emperor, but to heal us, to save us. Luke tells us who the emperor is to show us how powerless the emperor is when it comes to matters of salvation. How in spite of his status, he can't stop what's coming next. And Jesus came as a peasant to upturn our ideas about power and might. 
the political hierarchy in the kingdom of God is nothing like what we've built. There's no emperor there, no, no governor, no president, no politicians even. There's only Jesus, the slaughtered and risen lamb who does not govern by strength with guns or swords, but with love, hesed, steadfast love. Heaven is upside down because it's the place where every valley is exalted. I think Luke is showing us that Jesus did not rise above everyone else to be crowned with laurels, but he's worthy to be praised because he is humble, because he came to give himself for everyone. Christ humbled himself, sacrificed himself, giving up all of his power to save the world. So the word of the Lord came to the son of a priest in the desert. Make straight the path for him. Looking at verses three through six, we don't know exactly what John was doing in the desert before this. Um, We do know that he was brought up probably knowing his purpose in life. His mother, Elizabeth and Mary had met while both Jesus and John were in the womb. The angel had spoken this prophecy. So we don't know what he was doing in the wilderness, but we do know that when the Spirit of God came to him, he knew why. So he preaches this message to the crowds. Repent, be baptized, (laughs) prepare to listen to the Messiah. I think John's purpose is to gather the crowds and to prepare them to to hear whatever it was that Jesus was going to, to bring. So the time has come for Jesus to begin his ministry. The Holy Spirit has sent John the Baptist ahead of him John is the voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And the kind of preparation that's demanded for this is repentance. Looking now at verse 7. The first words out of John's mouth are, are a rebuke, a strong one. Why? In Matthew's account of this scene, um, he tells us that John is responding so harshly to Pharisees who have come to receive this little extra dose of salvation. We know that some Pharisees had begun to splendidly miss the point of what faith in God meant by the time Jesus came around. Um, And the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were more likely than anyone else to count on the law that is, the Hebrew Scriptures and the covenant of circumcision, to justify any bad behavior, um, to say we are sons of Abraham. If their moral lives were in shambles, if they had forgotten how to act mercifully, if they were no longer capable of loving their neighbor, they could still point to the covenant and say we're okay. Um, And the next part of John's tirade seems to support this idea that it was the Pharisees that he was, that he was criticizing because he's focused on their lack of fruit. It says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Sound familiar? The language of that. John is brandishing Psalm 1 against them. Psalm 1, which has shown up a surprising number of times um, in our worship here over the last year or more, an image of the new creation that shows up all over Scripture. So actually, maybe it's not all that surprising that it's shown up so many times. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of living water 
that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And John says, the ax is at the root of the trees. All God's people are called to be like trees planted next to the river of Christ's fullness, which we find here in God's house, in worship, in the preaching of the word, in the word itself, in the sacraments, in baptism and communion, in the fellowship of God's people. We're called to be planted in those things. We're called to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God, to love our neighbors as ourselves. These are the kinds of fruit that we will bear if we love Jesus, if we seek him. Justice, love, humility. And that way of life is freely available to any who seek Jesus. But we have to seek him. So John starts with a rebuke because the crowds were in danger of being chopped down. And John had the distasteful task of telling them. Whether they were Pharisees who had focused too long on one incomplete part of religion, if they were just ordinary folks looking for a little extra assurance of salvation, or if the crowds were swelling for this baptism of repentance because it was the popular thing to do. That's what Eugene Peterson thinks, by the way. Um, No matter what kind of person this was coming to receive this baptism, to hear this preaching, they were missing the point if they did not approach the waters of baptism with a heart that was contrite before God, that was humble and repentant. So actually, he called them snakes because he had their best interests in mind. (laughs) John wanted to see a visible change in the lives of those he baptized. A change that would last beyond tomorrow or next week. A life change. John was preaching to people who belonged to the covenant family of God, but went on casting judgments against each other, amassing wealth for themselves while ignoring the poor around them. There were tax collectors there who overcharged regularly, soldiers who used threat of violence to steal from people they didn't like. When did it become normal for taxpayers to overcollect into their own bank accounts? And how many soldiers found it morally acceptable to perform shakedowns. These people were grossly misusing their power for their own gain, perpetuating injustice instead of acting justly. But this is interesting. John's answer to them is not to quit their job or to leave or to bring sacrifices to the temple. He simply says, stop doing that. Stop stealing money from people. Stop threatening them. Stop amassing wealth and hoarding it for yourself. Start giving your things away to those who need them. Change your life. So stop fighting. Stop the addiction. Stop the pride. Stop lying. Whatever it is you do. The invitation this morning is to stop and turn and repent of it. Jesus is waiting for us to do just that. I wonder if part of the difficulty these people had in front of them is that everyone else is doing it. Soldiers don't perform shakedowns on their own. They would have to go in a gang. Tax collectors had colleagues. What if they fell behind? 
And everybody walked past the poor, the blind and the lame, the people who had zero shirts. These are all deeply entrenched habits, even social systems. To, to stop doing them might mean losing friends or creating enemies or losing the income that you'd gotten used to. What would it take to be different, to be a people set apart, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, love your neighbor. If you claim Jesus as your Lord and you're not doing those things, think again, you might need to change your life. And using this verse, Micah 6, 8, um, I'm using it because I think it summarizes John's teaching to the crowds. Do justice, he says to them. Give clothes to those who have none. Do justice, he says to the tax collector who sometimes would use their power to steal. Love mercy, he says to the soldier who would use their weapons to threaten violence against those who had no defense. And walk humbly with your God, he says to all of them, by repenting of your sin, turning from your wicked ways. I wonder if there's a sin in your life that you need to turn from today. Pride that needs to turn to humility. A lie that needs to turn to truth. Now is the time to turn from it. Now is the time to make a life change. If you call Christ Lord, you are saved. If you were baptized in those waters, you were forgiven. But moving forward was never going to be easy. There are always going to be things that we need to slough off, branches that need to be pruned so that we can walk the road of righteousness. So do justice, love mercy, Walk humbly with your God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you, and we sit under this maybe difficult teaching, knowing that that you look on us with compassion, that you look on us ready to forgive. Because all who are baptized into Christ are protected by him. When you look at us, you see him. So let us also be so humble and repentant, we pray. We love you and in your name, amen. Would you rise if you're able?
Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty Save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, Savior, he can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author salvation heroes and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave 